Okay, so we'll go through a brief tour and a little bit of history about the world's high energy particle accelerators. Really the birthplace of modern accelerators <coughs> was the University of California in Berkeley at the Radiation Laboratory. And this is what the original radiation laboratory looked like. You can see the campanile of the University of California. Um, and that's still there today, but the, but the radiation lab is gone. And this is where the first cyclotrons were made. And again, this is E.O. Lawrence holding the very first morning half inch cyclotron. You can see the two Ds. This is the gap across which the, accelerate, the particles would get accelerated. They would come in from over here. There were some vacuum pump up ports, high voltage sources, all that stuff. 1930. <coughs> Next big one was the 11 inch cyclotron. That's here, and the cyclotron itself was 11 and a half inches or 11 inches in diameter. You can see how big a magnet you needed just for something to put across. And this is all the related electronics here. And I apologize for the quality of the photographs. Uh, again, this is a 60 inch. So Neil Lawrence was on a good thing and said, you know what? I'm going to build bigger, as big as I can. And ultimately, he built something. The biggest one they built was a 184 inch cyclotron that was built in the 19th. Um, that can, you can see the 60 inch in the background. And you see that the group of people involved had grown and had the accelerators. Now you had this massive um, magnet. Literally, they, um, to build this accelerator, they laid a foundation, they built the magnet, and then they built the building around the magnet. And in fact, to this day, this building still exists at Berkeley. It's called the Advanced Light Source. And the magnet yoke is a huge step. Rather than take it out, it was going to be such a pain. The magnet yoke is still there, and they built a new accelerator underneath it. This is my colleague Mike standing in the yoke of the old 184 inch and above the advanced light source a couple of years ago. This is a view from the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. So it sits up on a hill. Golden Gate Bridge is there. The city of San Francisco is over here. Beautiful view up there. Got to go sometime. We have a great science museum, too, further up called the Lawrence Hall of Science, where you can see um, Ernest Lawrence's Nobel Prize, the first cyclotron. And you can look down and see where the 184-inch cyclotron was. And there's another building where antiprotons were first produced in the 1960s. <coughs> the next big step in accelerators is something called the Cosmos. <coughs> it became a national laboratory on Long Island in New York in the 1950s. It was a synchrotron with four maggots, with four very big maggots. Um, but you can see how things had changed. The very first practical synchrotron. Russians got into the game with the Soviets in the 1950s with their thing called the synchro phasotron, which was slightly bigger, you can see, than the cosmotron. Huge magnets, they didn't worry about focusing that much in the days. It was really dipole magnets. You suck the particles in and you accelerated them, and you see how things turned out. Brookhaven got back in the game with that alternating radiant. Um, theory, we had alternating focusing defocusing magnets. Well, they built a machine called the Alternating Gradient Synchrotron in the 1960s, early 1960s. This was the footprint of it under construction at the time. So you can see, bigger machine, but much more compact magnets. Instead of having those huge things that you could stand on top of, this is now something, maybe this total thing is six feet tall. And these magnets were much more compact, but we could gain um, much higher energies in, the, in those previous synchrotrons. Soviets were back in the game in the 1970s. This was the most powerful machine in the 1970s called the U-70 synchrotron. And U-70 because it had a maximum energy of 70 million, 70 GeV. But again, you see the synchrotron dipole magnets. These were actually combined functions. So these magnets did both, both focusing and bending simultaneously. But compared to that guy standing on top of the synchrophasotron, you see it's much more compact and yet much higher energy. <coughs> This thing called Fermilab came out of the scenes actually back in the 1960s. It was known as the National Accelerator Laboratory, but it was renamed Fermilab after Enrico Fermi in the 70s. And in 1972, um, the maximum energy achieved by a particle accelerator went from 70 GeV in Russia to 400 and then 500 GeV with the, with the uh, main ring. The main ring was a top ring of magnets here, conventional electromagnets. Red ones were, were uh, focusing quadrupole magnets, and then there were four blue dipole magnets, and that would alternate back and forth. 
And later in the 1980s, we built a superconducting tevatron that was installed underneath the main ring, the same lattice where you would have a quadrupole magnet, four dipole magnets, another quadrupole magnet focusing in the opposite plane. And that has achieved a maximum energy of, in the single direction of 980 GeV, so nearly <coughs> the energy of the main ring, and yet the operating costs, because it was superconducting, are half what they were in the main ring era. Over in uh, Hamburg, Germany, uh, they recently turned off a machine called Hera, which was a rather unique particle accelerator. In fact, you see its outline here. It actually went through the city of Hamburg, Germany. This is a horse race track. This is uh, the soccer stadium. There's a um, arena for hockey and concerts here. There's a city park here. Houses along here, <coughs> soccer fields. This is the Daisy Laboratory. But like 100 meters underground, there was a particle accelerator colliding protons and electrons, a superconducting machine um, in, in Hamburg, Germany. And that was uh, a biggie that came online in the 1990s. They, uh, just this summer, they turned off here up after about a good 20, 25 year run. They're now really getting focused on superconducting radio frequency Linux. Um, Daisy is actually building a new <coughs> thing, um, uh, an X-ray free electron laser accelerator that's going to be extending out this way for about 20 kilometers. Over in Geneva, Switzerland, they've also been building accelerators since the 1950s at a place called CERN, the European Center for Nuclear or for Particle Physics. Um, they had a big machine they built in the 19, 1990s called LEP. LEP stands for Large Electron Positron Collider. So this was instead of protons, antiprotons, electron positrons. But these were the this was the accelerator, 27 kilometers in circumference. And if you look, this is not a straight tunnel. It's actually curved, but it's such a huge machine that it looks like a nearly straight machine in one cross section. And that was the biggie in the 1990s. Brookhaven got back in the game in early 2000 with a device called a Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider. So it's a superconducting machine. You see one ring of magnets, superconducting magnets here, one behind, and they accelerate <coughs> heavy ions, things like gold and copper ions and collide them to try and recreate the quark gluon plasma that was uh, what we think was part of the early universe. So they don't use photons or electrons, they use heavier stuff, but still use it to accelerate, try and get more dense collisions going on. Maybe not the luminosities we have, but it's also interesting to see what happens when heavy stuff hits. Uh, this is an overview of Brookhaven National Laboratory today. And this is where the Cosmotron was located. This is the footprint of the AGS today. And then you see in the background, this is the footprint of the relativistic heavy ion collider. So where once the AGS dominated the landscape at Brookhaven, you now see it's, it's eclipsed by Rick. In fact, uh, the AGS is still in operation today and is an early stage of an acceleration of particles going into Rick. <coughs> Cornell University in upstate New York has an accelerator called uh, CSER, Cornell Electron Storage Ring, and it's located underneath the football field. Barely would know it's there. <coughs> Out in, um, around San Francisco, just south of San Francisco at Stanford University, there's a Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. They have a two mile long linear accelerator. Um, does electrons and positrons. Over the years, they've added a couple circular storage rings um, around here, but that's really the granddaddy of all um, linear accelerators to this point. Show you a picture of a U-70 in Russia. Well, this is the footprint of that in the beautiful uh, Russian background. And then there's Fairyland, seen from high altitude. High rise is right here, we're sitting over there. <coughs> 10 square mile site, 6,800 acres. And now we'll talk a little bit, but we won't quite yet. Um, CERN, European Organization for Nuclear Research. Um, this is the footprint of the Large Hadron Collider. Also, it was the same tunnel that LEP was in, um, 27 kilometers around. Here's the Geneva International Airport. This is Lake Geneva. Downtown Geneva is here. These are something called the Swiss Alps. 